Sheriff, is he making another run for it? No, no. He ran out of asphalt in the middle of the night and asked me if he could come down here. All he's trying to do is make that their turn. No, 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 no! Ah, oh, great! This ain't asphalt, son. This is dirt. Oh, great. What do you want? You here to gloat? You don't have three-wheel brakes, so you got to pitch it hard, break it loose, and, and just drive it with the throttle. Give it too much, you'll be out of the dirt and into the tulips. So you're a judge, a doctor, and a racing expert. I'll put it simple. If you're going hard enough left, you'll find yourself turning right. Oh, right. That makes perfect sense. Turn right to go left. Yes! Thank you! Or should I say no thank you? Because in opposite world, maybe that really means thank you! <laughs> Crazy grandpa car. <laughs> Well, good evening. My name is Anna Eckley, and I am a chaplain as well as the Hope Sports Coordinator here at the West Moines campus. And I am so excited and honored to be worshiping with you tonight. We just saw a clip from the movie Cars, and I think that maybe I've preached enough times that maybe you're starting to see a coincidence that whenever I'm preaching, there's also a Pixar movie. I don't know. We're just going to keep going with it, though. But we just saw a clip from the movie Cars. And a few days before this clip took place, Lightning McQueen, the young, red, shiny, very flashy race car, was challenged in a race by the older car whose name is Doc. And the Lightning McQueen went into this race thinking that old man doesn't stand a chance. I'm faster, I'm the best race car in the world. What could he possibly know about racing? And, well, the race didn't go as Lightning McQueen thought it was going to, be, going to go because they were on a gravel track instead of the asphalt track that he's used to. So his sharp turns looked a little bit not as sharp as they should have. So the clip that we saw was a few days later when he was out practicing on his own. And we saw Doc go up and give some friendly advice that essentially was, you have to turn right to go left. And of course, Lightning McQueen is like, what type of advice is that? That's crazy. But we see Lightning McQueen has kind of an ego problem. He doesn't fully think things through. He doesn't have respect for the art of making sharp turns on gravel like Doc did. And so he gives it a shot, and we see how it goes at the end of the clip. He goes off the cliff. Really bad situation for Lightning McQueen. It's a humorous clip, though. And hopefully through the clip, we get the point of what it looks like to have a high ego. Maybe we can think of someone in our own life who has a high ego. Or maybe we think of ourselves. And if that's you, we're going to talk about it tonight. Because this clip is the perfect segue into the second habit of highly effective Christians, which is the sermon series that we're on. But I'm going to leave you on a cliffhanger because we're going to go back to the first habit that we learned last week. For a quick review, last week we looked at habit number one, which starts in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. And verse 2 says... Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but instead let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Habit number one is follow Jesus, not the crowd. So then today, habit number two, we continue through Romans 12, starting in verse 3, like we heard Charlotte read for our Bible reading earlier. But verse 3 says, because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves. 
measure yourself against the faith that God has given you. In verse 16, live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And don't think that you know it all. Paul says, don't think that you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourself. Measure yourself by the faith God has given you. Don't be too proud and don't think you know it all. Habit number two is get over yourself. Now I had to ask another pastor on staff if it was like fun, joking, get over yourself. Or if it was serious, get over yourself. Because although we're saying the same thing, they kind of mean different things, if you know what I mean. But we decided it was both. Get over yourself and get over yourself. Whichever one you need to hear tonight. So go ahead and take a moment, do a quick little internal evaluation just to determine which one it is. But really, either one, get over yourself. Humility is the second habit of being a highly effective Christian. And I chose the clip for today because Lightning McQueen is the perfect character that I think we can all agree needs to get over himself. But to be honest, when I first looked at the message title and the short little segment that we get for sermon prep, and I saw that it said humility, be humble, get over yourself, I literally laughed out loud because I personally have been so humbled lately in my life. As some of you in the room might know, I'm a new mom. This is my family, this is my husband David, and that's our little boy, Everett. He is four months, almost five months. But you wanna know what the most humbling thing I have ever experienced, what that is? It's being dictated by a little squishy potato. I thought that I knew parenting was going to have its ups and downs. I knew it was going to have its challenges. But I also thought, look at how many people did this before me. How hard could it really be? Oh my gosh. I don't know why anyone didn't tell me. But I did so much research going into this. I thought I would get the wake windows right so I would have a good little sleeper. I thought that I would be good at breastfeeding because you know it's the natural response to having a baby as a woman. I also thought I would just raise the most advanced baby and he would already be walking, if not running by now. But nope, my little potato sleeps or doesn't sleep when he wants to. Breastfeeding is very hard, and he has absolutely zero motivation to even roll because we carry him everywhere. It's so hard to put him down when he's so cute. Parenting is the epitome of turn right to go left. So we have Lightning McQueen, who has been humbled by an older and wiser car. We have a new mom here who's been humbled by her little squish When all along, since 55 AD, Paul has been telling us not to take ourselves too seriously. I could have saved myself a lot of heartache if I would have just listened to scripture. The truth is, though, that get over yourself is probably something that we all need to hear. Because as a culture, we have become so self-centered. We have become so prideful, which is the opposite of having humility. Being prideful is what's normal for us. We trust our minds, we trust our experiences, we even trust our inexperience more than we trust anything else. We hear younger generations saying, those older generations don't know anything. And vice versa, we hear the older generations saying, those younger generations, They don't know anything. We hear members of one political party saying, we are actually 120% correct, and there's not even room to hear what the other side could think. We have churches saying that there's only one way to worship. There's only one way to read scripture. There's only one way to have a relationship with Jesus. And if you're not doing it our way, then you're doing it wrong. And what this pride, this statue, statue of pride has led us to 
is that as a culture, we are so self-centered. And maybe you're like, well, technically in the reading, didn't Paul tell us to think about ourselves? And yes, he did. But there's a difference between being self-aware and being self-centered. And as a culture, if these were on a spectrum of self-awareness and self-centeredness, we would be way over here. We are so self-centered. We think that we are better than others. We think that we have it figured out. We think that we can do a better job than other people could. We think that we can do a better job than God could. We don't think that we need God. And to all of that, Paul says, get over yourself. There's a difference between being self-centered and self-aware. And the difference is a posture of humility. Self-awareness allows us to reflect on our thoughts and our experiences in relationship to the world around us. And when we do this, when we think about these things in relationship to what's going on around us, we quickly realize that we don't have it all figured out. Maybe I'm not actually better than anyone else. Paul teaches us that this posture of humility is being honest in our evaluation of ourself. Measure yourself by the faith that God has given you. Be self-aware, but not self-centered. Measure yourself by seeing God as the sole author of the world. Measure yourself with soul dependency on God. Don't measure yourself against others and what they say or do or don't say or don't do. Measure yourself against God. And out of this genuine faith, humility will follow. Humility is when we go from saying, I know everything, to actually saying, I don't have it all figured out right now. And this is the emotional posture of humility. I think that us as human beings, we have an emotional, a physical, and spiritual posture to the way that we approach life. And we're going to go through the physical and spiritual posture next. But first, this is the emotional posture I don't have it figured out. So to figure out if we have the physical posture though, I'm going to lead you through a little exercise. I'm going to lead you through some questions for reflection. So the first question I'm going to ask you is what are your shoulders doing right now? Are they up kind of tense, pulled up close to your ears? That's because you're holding so much tension and anxiety in the core of your body that it radiates up. If your shoulders are up, I invite you to just relax them. Let them drop. You're in a safe space. The next question I have is what is your forehead doing right now? Are your eyebrows raised because you can't believe what the preacher is saying? Or are you stuck in a frown? Maybe it's subconscious. Go ahead and just relax your eyebrows. What about your jaw? Is your tongue pushed up against the roof of your mouth? Is there tension in your jaw? You're clenching your teeth? Go ahead and just relax your jaw. We've gone through our shoulders, our forehead, our jaw. And now what are your legs doing? Are they bouncing? Are they shaking? Did you know that restless leg syndrome actually comes from our body because we're holding anxiety in it, whether we know it or not? If you're able, go ahead and put both feet on the ground and just let yourself be grounded. Yeah, a few of us are shifting in the room. The last one is what are your hands doing? Sometimes in the day, I look down at my hand and I have fingernail, nail marks, because I was clenching my fist and I didn't even know it. I'm holding on to my world so tightly. What are your hands doing? Are they balled up in fists like this? Are you holding your leg? Are you gripping on to your phone? 
Go ahead and put your hands on your legs and then turn your palms face up. Whatever you're holding on to, you can go from physically holding the weight of your world and just releasing it to God. And this simple action of just opening up your palms is a way to say, Lord, with humility and faith, I give this to you. We went through our shoulders, our forehead, our jaw, our leg, and our hands. Go ahead and just take a deep breath. This is a physical posture of humility. You guys look really relaxed. Have you ever found yourself here before? Some people believe that the tension that we hold in our body reflects the anxiety that we are also holding, the need for control, the need for responsibility. I don't know about you, but this relaxed state feels a lot better than being tensed up. This is the physical posture of humility, palms open, releasing control, tension in, and contention in your life and saying, I don't know, I don't have this figured out, but I know who does. There have been many moments, many long nights as a new mom with Everett the last few months. When I'm bouncing him, when I'm rocking him, when I have Googled every trick in the book, just trying to get him to calm down and sleep. I'm tense and it's not helping either of us. But it's when I go through this and I think about relaxing different parts of my body releasing the tension that I'm holding on to of trying to get it to go the way that I want it to go, when I release these things and I say, Lord, I give this to you, there is nothing more that I can do right now, but I know that you can do something here. When I invite God to meet me in these moments, I am much more calm and it's more peaceful and I'm able to meet Everett with exactly what he needs because I've allowed the Lord to meet me with what I need. When I lean into my faith and when I release control, I find myself in the physical posture of humility. And when I do this, I'm a better mother, I'm a better wife, I'm a better daughter, I'm a better coworker. When I say, okay, I don't have it figured out, but I know who does, and I'm self-aware that maybe I'm not right in every situation. It's a little bit easier. And whatever it might be for you, when you release that control, maybe you're a better coworker, maybe you're a better spouse, maybe you're a better grandparent or a child, but I know for a fact that you are in a better relationship with Jesus when you're in this posture. Sometimes in our culture, we confuse the status of being humble or having humility as being weak. We think that being humble means that we can't be confident in ourselves. We can't stick up for ourselves or we can't stick up for other people. We just have to let people be mean, sometimes take advantage of us. But what I thought was interesting was that with a quick Google search of synonyms of humility, these are the words that pop up. Respectful simple, polite, content, modest, courteous, gentle, unassuming. Being humble does not mean that you are weak. And some know this better than others because as I look around the room, I'm confident that almost all of us, if not all of us, know someone who has struggled or who currently struggles with addiction. Or we know people who have been affected by those who struggle with addiction. Addiction is a disease in which you have a physical and psychological need to a particular substance, activity, or thing. And that's a very short and simple sentence for a very complex disease. When people struggle with addiction, they more often than not find themselves making decisions that put themselves in harm's way 
or put other people at risk of physical or emotional harm. And sometimes when they get to a point where they can recognize that addiction has a really strong hold on their life and they're ready to take the next step for help, one of the ways that they do this is by entering a 12-step program. You might be familiar with some of these programs. We offer one at Hope here on Thursday nights called Celebrate Recovery. But there's also Alcoholics Anonymous, AA. There's Narcotics Anonymous. There are so many different programs because addiction is not a one-size-fits-all. There's a space for every single form of addiction to find and receive help. But I'm talking about the 12-step program because step seven of the 12-step programs is finding freedom from the things that control people's lives. Step seven is to humbly ask him to remove our shortcomings. When Christians go through these programs, they more often than not identify him as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But step seven recognizes that our greatest defect is being self-centered, living in a way that serves ourself. Which when we look at addiction, we know that it's actually not serving anyone. But it's a belief and a very loud lie that those who suffer hear. That it's about my needs, that it's about my wants, that it's about my desires and what I want to do. And the seventh step says, let's take a step back. Let's turn our attention out from ourselves and let's let humility guide us in what we do. And I talk about this because I would never say that someone who struggles with addiction or someone who has gone through a 12-step program, I would never call them weak. Humility is not the same as being weak. Strength comes from humility. Strength to change, strength to release, strength to fight some of the hardest battles that people fight. Humility's strength comes from being open to God to allow us to see all the things that make us imperfect and seek God's help in overcoming those things. And just as being humble does not mean being weak, it also does not mean being self-deprecating or not having confidence in who you are. When you're humble, you are very confident in who you are. You are confident in who God has designed you to be. You are confident in the gifts that God has given you. You are confident in the ways that you have persevered through your life. And you have gratitude. You are proud of yourself. You're proud of your hard work. There is such a fine line between having self-awareness and being self-centered. And if we're not easy, if we're not careful, it's way easier to fall on the self-centered side. But Paul says we must avoid having too high of an estimate of ourselves. And then we also must avoid having too low of an estimate of ourselves. The latter, avoiding having too low of an estimate of ourselves, is illustrated in the gospel story that we can find in Luke 14. When Jesus is teaching that if you're invited to a wedding, you shouldn't go in and sit at the highest seat of honor because what if someone, like the bride and the groom, come in and they have to tell you, you can't sit there. You have to go sit at the lowest seat. Jesus says that would be embarrassing. Instead, save yourself from that embarrassment and sit at the lowest seat. And maybe you're like, well, didn't you just say not to be self-deprecating? Why would I sit at the lowest seat? Sure, I get that I shouldn't sit at the highest seat, but I don't think I should sit at the lowest. I think I should just sit somewhere right in the middle. But when we do this, when you play this mental math game, we're missing the point. Jesus is saying you're trying to take control over something that you don't have control over. That takes way too much energy. We shouldn't be offended when Jesus says to sit at the lowest spot at the table because it's good news. The good news is that we have 
a seat at the table. Jesus doesn't say, don't even bother coming because there's not a place for you here. Jesus says, come just as you are, sit at the lowest spot, and I'll show you where to go from there. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't feel normal to sit at the lowest spot. This is like the gospel version of turn right to go left. But this is what God desires for us. This is the spiritual posture of humility. When we can say, I don't have it figured out, but I know who does and I trust him. I don't know where I'm supposed to sit, but I know who does. So I'm just going to sit down and I'll let him show me. Having this posture, the emotional, physical, and spiritual, having this posture of humility plays into our life when we're thinking about ourselves just as much when we think about the world around us. A posture of humility means that we have reverence for our brothers and sisters in Christ. It means that we live in awe of not only what God's doing in our life, but also what God is doing in others' life even if it's the people that we disagree with. You have a seat at the table, and so do they. So come with eyes to see, ears to listen. Come with a teachable spirit. Come with arms open to connect with others. Come with confessions of the ways that you have wronged others or you have wronged God. Come to the table because there's a seat for you there. And show up. Sit in a place that maybe makes you uncomfortable. But see where God and how God shows up for you. Next weekend here at Hope is Rally Weekend. And it's a really fun weekend for us. There's some empty seats in this room. There is space to invite people. And you might say, oh, but it's really uncomfortable inviting people. And to that, Paul says, get over yourself. At Hope, we are unapologetic about how many different programs we offer to try to reach every single person in this community. There's room here. So don't be too proud to invite your neighbors, to invite your parents, to invite your grandparents. And you might be like, well, what if they say no? And to that, I say, what if they say yes? What if your invite, what if you humbling yourself and your invite is the reason that they get to know and experience the love of Christ? What if it's your invite that allows them to find a place where they feel like they belong and they've never had that before? Don't be too proud. Don't take yourself too seriously. We are called to imitate Jesus who showed up at the foot of the table and invited us all to come along for the ride so that we can experience God. Jesus showed up at the lowest place time and time again. And look what God did. Those who humble themselves will be exalted. That's from Luke 14. When he was mocked and when he was crucified at the cross for a crime he didn't commit, he took the lowest place so that we could know God's love, so that our sins are forgiven. Thank you so much for tuning in and joining us for Service Online. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. We don't think it's any accident that you're here and we have been praying for you. To see more of our content, know when we go live and stay up to date week to week, feel free to subscribe to this channel. And if you live close by one of our campuses or local sites, we invite you to check us out in person. We would love to meet you. And don't forget to follow us on social media to stay up to date. See you next week.